Today I'm speaking to David Satter, journalist and historian with unique insights into how the defamation and repressions of the past is having terrible consequences for present day Russia. David has written extensively about Russia and the Soviet Union, especially the decline and fall of the USSR and the rise of post-Soviet Russia. David became the first American journalist to be expelled from Russia since the Cold War in December 2013. But from 1976 to 1982, he was the Moscow correspondent of the Financial Times and then became a special correspondent on Soviet affairs for the Wall Street Journal. He's author of several books that are essential reading to help understand the origins of the current crisis, including, and they have some of the most brilliantly named titles in the entire category of books about Russia and the USSR. For instance, it was a long time ago and it never happened anyway. Darkness at Dawn, The Rise of the Russian Criminal State, the Less You Know, The Better You Sleep, that is one of my favourites, and there are now two volumes of Never Speak to Strangers and other writings from Russia and the Soviet Union. Welcome to Silicon Cut Podcast. Please like, subscribe, and definitely comment, uh, especially to help new people discover the incredible guests like David that we feature on the channel. Please also check out the validated Ukrainian charities that appear in the description of the video. Ukraine needs all our assistance and support at this time to help it towards victory. Please also do consider, after you've done that, buying me a coffee to help support the work of the channel. David, I'm delighted to welcome you back. And if people enjoyed this conversation, I strongly advise them to check out the previous four videos on the channel. But welcome back to Silicon Curtain. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm glad to be with you. Well, let's start with your books. We're going to go on to current events, including the horrific attack uh, that happened yesterday in Kiev. But let's start with the book that you brought out, the second volume of your writings about your experiences of living, working, traveling in Russia and the USSR. What impressions, as I'm sure you had to go through and sort of proofread and reread and rewrite some of this stuff, what are the impressions you're getting as you do that with these memories of a period prior to the current toxic, even genocidal nature of the regime? Um, do you feel a sense of dissonance or is there continuity you find in some of these writings with the present day? Oh, I think there's a great deal of continuity. I think what has happened in the in the present situation is that the underlying mentality, the underlying psychological construction of the Russian na nation uh, has simply reemerged after a period in which uh, there were superficial changes. And uh, I say there were superficial because the basis for market relations, democratic institutions, uh, a decent treatment of people, that was never created. Uh, there was never a, a, a change in the mentality of people. There was never the establishment of the rule of law. The thing to understand, in, in, understand about Russia is that it really is different from the other countries of Europe. This is what Napoleon said. Uh, he said there are two, two countries in Europe, Russia and everyone else. Uh, and the difference is that Russia, in terms of its mentality, is not so much a country, it's rather a movement. It has the mentality of a movement. Now, we, we have movements also in the West. And we know from experience what happens when people become part of a movement. Uh, the individual matters very little in such a situation. Everything, the only thing that really matters is the goal of the movement. And people take psychological uh, <clears throat> comfort from the fact that they're part of a great uh, idealistic whole, which is moving in a certain direction. Uh, of which they approve. Uh, under those conditions, there's little concern for the insights, the doubts, uh, the the hesitations of, of, of any individual. But here in the West, we have movements of that kind and we see we see political movements rise and fall. But they 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 do so within the context of, you know, if we're talking about Britain or we're talking about the US, 
they do, or France, they, they do so in the context of a democratic society. Uh, as a result, uh, there, there are certain limits to the harm they can do. Russia is different. The whole country is organized psychologically like a movement. Uh, and the institutions of law, the institutions of, 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 even of religious belief, of, uh, of, 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 of culture, uh, are subordinated to the goals of the movement. Uh, if, if there are trials in Russia, uh, if there's some type of legal process that takes place now and then, it's it's re really uh, it only goes so far as not to threaten the holders of power, who of course, uh, needless to say, uh, uh, are uh, directing the country in their own interests. If the if it happens that uh, they see advantages in creating pseudo-Western institutions, in engaging in the West, uh, with the West, in commercial uh, or uh, politi political uh, relationships, it's only, this can only be conditional. And we had the uh, confirmation of that with the attack on Ukraine. What what Putin did was simply to discard what had been created, and many people were amazed, including many Russians, by how easy it was to discard all that had been created during the decades after the fall, or seemingly created after the fall of the Soviet Union, and uh, attach himself to the underlying mentality, the underlying drive of the country, which, of course, will support whoever is in power. Uh, the, it's um, when, when the Second World War broke out, uh, there, were, there was no shortage of people who hated Stalin in the Soviet Union. But they, but, but they coalesced around a leader uh, it helped, of course, that the the uh, the country that uh, had attacked uh, the Soviet Union was even worse in many respects than the Soviets were. But this instinct uh, to rally to a cause, to uh, to support a supreme leader. Uh, to uh, attach mystical significance to whatever it is that the supreme leader has said they have to fight for, to disregard the loss of life, all of this is is a reflection of the uh, and the and to commit atrocities, uh, in, under conditions in which people are imbued with the notion of collective responsibility. No one, no individual takes responsibility. All of this reflects the mentality of a movement and the fundamental character of Russia. I mean, what happened in Russia historically over the centuries is what in institutions that could support the dignity of the individual were never created. And to the extent that they, that they, they developed at all, they were, they were very weak. Needless to say, the apotheosis of the situation was the creation of the Soviet state in which the individual was explicitly defined as a cog in the machine of the state, not as an individual, but as a builder of communism. The fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the, the ideology was removed, but the mentality remained. Uh, and it, Take, takes very little for it to, to organize it uh, on behalf of the goals of whoever is in power. The only thing that would have made a difference, of course, is if the West had had the wherewithal after the fall of the Soviet Union to create, a, to, to try to work for a change in the political psychology of Russia, which could only go about, be brought about on the strength of respect for law and the creation of a state based on law, 
But neither the British nor the Americans, Americans may be in particular, nor the British as well, nor anybody else in the West, had any clear idea of what was going on in Russia. And uh, they, they, their attitude toward the country was extremely superficial. They didn't understand that the radical reformers in Russia were leaving intact everything that makes Russia dangerous. While they frantically uh, uh, acted to put property into the hands of criminals, on, under the uh, you know, under the assumption that they were creating the conditions of a, of a free market and the free market would create democracy and all problems would be solved of course that's not what happened once you once you once you sacrifice law once you take the property created by the combined efforts of the entire population put it into the hands of the most vicious elements in the society uh you're not going to have a democracy. I mean, it was Adam Smith who understood that the market is based on equivalent, equivalent exchange. I give you something, and you give me something, and they're roughly equivalent in value. Now, of course, they are maybe not the same things, of course, but the idea is that the, the, they're equivalent in value. You, I go out and buy a uh, a television set or something, and and a certain share of my earnings go go to pay for it. Uh, but that presupposes, and I think it's obvious from the formula, a regulatory framework within which these equal relations take can be carried out because it's too complicated otherwise. And if 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 there is no such regulatory framework, if there's no 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 set of law laws, and what's more important, no no moral outlook capable of giving rise to law, then and if the and if the objective is simply to change the economic structures and put property in private hands irrespective of whether uh, that property is being handed over to criminals, well, of course you're not going to receive, you know, because the basic assumptions of, of the market economy are not going to be fulfilled. The idea, you know, the, that, that the most efficient producers will be able to uh, uh, rise to the top. They can, there'll be rising prosperity. Everyone will play by the rules. Uh, but the people who 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 rose to the top in the new Russia, they had no intention of playing by the rules. And they acquired their property through a process that had nothing in common with the rules. So under these circumstances, you had nothing capable of counteracting or in some way changing or influencing the messianic mentality of the country that has been bred over hundreds of years and was reflected in the fact that the country acts and thinks like a movement, not like a nation. Almost and it treats indiv individuals not as individuals, but as raw material, mm -hmm. just as part, you know, just re replaceable parts. And this is really incredibly important because this naivety which um really caused the west to to put its support behind yeltsin uh you know uh, those emerging statists or re-emerging sort of statists uh, and and to keep the status quo we can go back to uh, bush's chicken kiev speech and even the policy of uh escalation management now it seems to be geared around fearing the collapse of the russian empire it seems to be geared around preserving as you say, aspects of the system that make them dangerous, the pure imperial aspect, which is that most of the wealth, most of the power, most of the control and prestige ends up in Moscow in a small number of hands. I think the figure is somewhere like 90%. I mean, I know many countries will have capitals that suck up, you know, um, a lot of resources, 
but it's just the sheer contrast, the sheer scale of that in Russia uh, is entirely deforming of sort of growth uh, and, and uh, you know, any any kind of agency emerging in other places. So it seems that our policies then and our policies now are geared around supporting that Russian vertical. We also know that that vertical supports the KGB, the Sylvia Key, and all those instruments of coercion and 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 sort of terror. And of course, you know, the Red Fortress, uh, the Tsar and the Red Fortress, the whims um, of whom, uh, you know, wars are started, people are murdered, tortured, etc. We seem to be complicit in keeping that system going and not introducing anything uh, or trying to introduce anything uh, by way of rule of law. In fact, we've allowed oligarchs to export their money and wealth into our systems, which give them that rule of law, thereby removing an incentive for them to create a domestic uh, version of that. Well, there, there, there are many different points here. I think that the um, es the fear of escalation uh you, we're at a much later stage now. The years during which we could have done something, and I, I know this from personal experience, because I made very serious efforts over the years to talk to the people who were making policy in the United States, and Brit even in Britain to a degree, uh, and to explain to them what they were not understanding and it, and I, I I can say with 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 uh, with complete confidence that uh, uh, the level of understanding was pretty low. Uh, Boris Nemtsov and I, for example, tried to speak to one of the people who became an, an important advisor to President Obama, and explain the danger that Putin represented, uh, and. Uh, uh, but the, the, the policy of the Obama administration was that the problems in U.S.-Russian relations were uh, due to the policies of George W. Bush. And uh, within days of that conversation, and this also came, it was not just us talking to him. It was the, the, the nuclear poisoning of Alexander Litvinenko, who, by the way, was a British subject at the time, in, in, in London. It was the murder of uh, Anna Politkovskaya, Russia's outstanding investigative journalist and chronicler of the the horrors of Chechnya, in 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 her apartment in the uh, hallway of her apartment building. It was uh, the attack on Georgia, the invasion of Georgia, a sovereign state. Uh, you didn't need to be a genius to listen to you know what was in fact obvious advice but immediately afterward the uh, obama announced or i think it was then hillary clinton was the uh, secretary of state the policy of of reset the us was going to reset its policies uh in order to better accommodate russia's concerns uh, of course, typically, uh, the even the word reset was mistranslated. So they couldn't even get the Russian word right. So uh, it's it's uh, if we talk about policy, if we talk about the West, what we talk about first of all is superficiality, and this is bipartisan in the U.S. I know the Republicans accuse the Democrats, the Democrats accuse the Republicans. But you know, in one respect, they are simply united, there, and that is in terms of superficiality and lack of intellectual depth. Uh, and uh, the uh, the new policy was uh, uh, based, am among other things, on a on a, a wager on Dmitry Medvedev, without realizing that he was nothing but a a, a puppet. And uh, now, of course, when he's you know threatening nuclear war and 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 has been trotted out to scream all kinds of 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 uh, violent threats, uh, it's rather embarrassing for those who who made policy based on the idea that he was the progressive future of Russia. Uh, so 
when we talk about escalation management, uh, we're 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 dealing with a base of superficiality and justifiable fear. Uh, the Russians have been making threats of nuclear war since Khrushchev's time when he threatened to to, to uh, bomb London with, you know, launch nuclear bombs against London. When I was a correspondent in Moscow in the 70s and 80s, when we would meet with Russian officials as journalists, I was the Financial Times correspondent, you know, the, they would they they would you know, constantly refer to the danger of nuclear war. When Reagan be, made his entirely justified statements that the Soviet leaders were, re, you know, ready to lie and kill, uh, you know, they responded with the smell of nuclear war is in the air. I remember when you know more recently when we, uh, when there was talk of disconnecting Russia from the SWIFT system, the interbank transfer system which in fact now has been done they said that would be that would that would that would be nuclear war so there there's no, but but the average person uh is not a, you know i may be accustomed to that having heard it for years but the average american and i think that that uh, uh this is true of our the people who are in charge right now uh has not been hearing that that type of threat from a from People who actually have nuclear bombs, and who are uh, the, you know, in a position to give such an order, and of course it has an effect. Uh, they don't know the history. They don't know where it comes from. They don't know the society that has uh, that is has produced these people, these leaders, and the process through which they came to power. And so, of course, and they and and here is another thing they answer to their voters to to, you know, they answer to their public. Uh, a democratic leader cannot do the things that a, that an authoritarian or autocratic leader can do. He he can't he you know, he cannot act with the decisiveness and the firmness uh, that the situation requires if the population is not behind him and you know all of the you know the 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 intimidation of people in power is accompanied by the disinformation of the populations as we know so that's why we have this escalation management this is why it was very difficult for the british to stand up to hitler in the 1930s uh despite and and why they were so inclined to disregard the evidence, uh, with only a few people like Churchill and Duff Cooper and and others, you know, pointing out the obvious that that Hitler was preparing for war. And uh, this is this will always be the case, I'm afraid. Uh, what I'm hoping, nonetheless, is the barbarism of 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 the uh, of the Russians and the heroism and dedication of the Ukrainians will create a situation that is so hard to ignore uh, and so compelling that it will step by step and I think this we've seen this it has had this effect push you know, the, the very fallible people who are making these policies in the direction of giving Ukraine the help that it needs. I would not say that that help has been negligible, by the way. I personally was astonished that that Biden did as well as he did. I I, I certainly wish, wish, you know, obviously, had he been more decisive, had he been a but he's, he's not Winston Churchill um, or, or even close. It's but, you know, you know, for what he, for, yeah. you know, for what he is and for what the, we are and for what we allowed to develop in Russia, when it now, when, when, when greater knowledge and greater depth 
would it have, would have made it possible for us to prevent this war from ever taking place. Uh, but uh, uh, created what you know, the situation that we have we have now. Um, which is not hopeless, be? but it but, yeah. but require you know it's not hopeless, but it require you know there are certain things that have got to be done. And it seems that we're at this point, and I've been analysing all the steps. And as you say, if you look back at it, it is quite remarkable where we are, and I'm sure we're going to have further movements. So Ukraine is now allowed to strike on Russian territory, but if it's US weapons, it's only a thin hundred kilometer corridor which precludes almost all of the major uh, launch sites for missiles and so on there are not so many restrictions on french and uh, british weapons and after the two elections in those countries it seems no new red lines will be created there so that's good news um but there's a twin track with berlin and washington clearly far far more cautious far slower uh, and I would say reactive to change. So as you say, over two and a half years, we've come an extraordinary way and it's not an insignificant amount of munitions, but I would characterize Putin's behavior as on a sort of escalatory loop. This seems to be the only strategy he knows, which is to intensify the barbarism, intensify the violence um, and ratchet it up. In some ways he has the escalation initiative Almost at no point in this have the Western allies done something which is unexpected, something that would make him stop and think twice about his actions. In that respect, are we going to carry on another year, another two years, three years in this similar pattern of constantly reacting to Russia's brutality? No, I, I hope we won't. I hope we won't. Uh, but uh, the, you know the the um, there are many there are many things that need war is a test of will and in order to demonstrate will we have to have understanding oh uh, and this is why. Uh, I think we, we, we're all going to have to pay particular attention to the 25th anniversary of the apartment bombings that brought Putin to power. Uh, that September 9th was the, the building on Guryanova Street in Moscow was blown up in the middle of the night. Uh, I would hope to get to, to delve into this subject with you at greater length under a, in a different situation, but I can just summarize and say that that people have to know what's at stake and if they do uh i believe with all of our mis missteps with all of our uh, uh lack of resolution and 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 lack of seriousness we will nonetheless come to the proper conclusion and we're we're headed in that direction uh the um the Russians have achieved a lot with their threats. And they've definitely slowed the 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 evolution of the Western commitment at a cost of Ukrainian lives, by the way. But uh, if they're going to have any chance of prevailing in this conflict, they're going to have to escalate. And uh, and that means an escalation in the brutality, whether they intend it or not, uh, because they will they will have to put more and more pressure on the Ukrainians, resulting in more and more civilian deaths, uh, producing more and more atrocities, relying on criminals and newly mobilized troops who will be even less disciplined and more inclined toward atrocities than those who are already there. Uh, and provoking an inevitable response from the West, unless, of course, people who in who 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 are pretty retrograde in the West come to power, particularly in the United States, and uh, are able to, for whatever reason, 
stop the natural evolution of the situation, which is in the direction of greater Western involvement, greater support for Ukraine. And that uh, that is what is 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 perhaps most worrying. I mean, if the if if the Democrats win, or if in the U.S. if Trump wins, and follows good advice, which is not excluded, by the way, uh, we'll have one situation. But if he, uh, for whatever reason, sides with those who were successful in stopping the flow of arms to Ukraine, uh, then we'll have another situation because the Ukrainians have the will. They don't have the means. Uh, we have to have we have to provide them with the means and um i i don't go along with the idea that has been expressed by many that if trump is elected it automatically means that there'll be a kind of cut off of weapons or that ukraine will be betrayed the way afghanistan was betrayed but by, by, by trump incidentally Biden simply carried out the policy, uh, which, uh, but uh, I I paid attention to a couple of things that I think are noteworthy, and one of them is that it was Trump which gave Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House in the U.S., the political cover that he needed in order to put the arms appropriation and bill on a measure on the agenda and get it passed and get those get those arms to the ukrainians so uh it was trump who authorized the provision of javelin uh, uh missiles to uh the ukrainians that played such an important role in the defense of Kiev. so we don't know basically trump says a lot of things um but I, I hope that he is enough of a bully himself to recognize aggression when he sees it. Uh, will will, and to recognize who an enemy is. We'll see. Time will tell. Time will that, tell. That's the uncertainty, if, isn't it? I mean, it is it. it cannot it's a be terrible, uncertain. terrible yeah. uncertainty. Terrible uncertainty. But if if, um, but I think that the situation is not. Um, I think yeah, I I'd, I think that the likelihood is that whoever is president, we are going to continue to support Ukraine. Tell you the truth, but uh, uh, that's a guess, and it could well be wrong. If it is wrong, we're all in a lot of trouble. Now you will have studied the period of the First World War and Russia's involvement of that. Um, the period in particular that I'm fascinated by is, of course, Kerensky's government and that uh, that small window of opportunity that Russia had to go down a completely different path. It wasn't to be the provisional government in between the two revolutions decided to carry on the war and continue its commitments to allies. And that essentially sealed its fate as the Bolsheviks took over. But it's interesting to look at what happened to the Russian army at the sort of fag end of the First World War. They were fighting and fighting and fighting and dying and following orders up to a certain point. And then suddenly they weren't. And you had this collapse in the Russian army where people just started turning around and massacring their officers and you know throwing down their weapons if they were lucky enough to have a weapon, of course. We know that many had to share uh, weapons and that's part of the problem. Is is that sort of historical pattern far too optimistic for the current circumstance? We see videos coming out, Russian battalions complaining about this, that, and the other, but we don't see any mass mutiny. Is it a very different Russia now? Are we unlikely to see a catastrophic collapse of its army? Well, we have to remember about the First World War that the Russian army continued to fight and continued to to launch offensives until the czar was once the czar was removed that was the crit that was critical when once the czar had ab abdicated abdicated kerensky was no law they no longer able to uh 
the it was then that of course the the Bolsheviks were doing everything possible to to uh subvert the army but what it was the removal of the czar which was the, the and his abdication that was critical for the collapse of the front uh now uh we had a foretaste of something that might have had that effect when in the Prigozhin revolt. But as we see, it was interesting how well he was greeted in the in Rostov, which was the headquarters of the Southern Command, how little resistance there was to him, how he was able in the course of 24 hours to, to move within striking distance of Moscow before it all fell apart. But uh, yes, I mean, uh, if there were a collapse of, a, of authority in Moscow, uh, there might be a, there might well be a collapse of the front. But I, my guess is that it would, that what will happen will happen somewhat differently if it happens. Uh, a, uh, a decisive defeat at the hands of the uh, of the Ukrainians, uh, and uh, that that that's probably what's and and then uh, that would embolden people in Moscow to seize power or at least to demand an end to the war. Uh, I think that's more likely. The problem is that you know, Russians historically have shown uh, a, uh, an astonishing capacity to accept horrendous casualties and to keep fighting. And of course, this is very much part of the national tradition that the 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 Russian soldier doesn't you know will will fight to the end, and this is this is actually amazed the Germans when they attacked uh, the Soviet Union and they reported back that we are now fighting against a, a foe that's completely different from the foe we 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 experienced in the West. Uh, the Russians will not quit until until they're just blown to pieces. They won't surrender. They the um, the Russians lost three times as many men in battles with the Germans where they were victorious. Uh, and so that isn't to say that there isn't a breaking point there, especially because especially given the the awareness of the criminal nature of the russian authorities but what is happening in russia is people are saying well we're fighting not for putin we're fighting for russia russia cannot be allowed to lose the war maybe was a mistake to start but now that 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 it has started we 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 have to we have to win um uh, all of this ha is is you know playing into the situation it has its limits, I'm sure. What those limits are, I don't know. But I think rather than expecting you know, a revolt in the ranks, although I wouldn't exclude it, exclude it entirely, uh, the, the, the more likely trigger for something like that is, is a significant Ukrainian victory. This is what we have to try to guarantee. And, we, you know, uh, and they're, they're a good army if they need to be armed. And it seems the ratios, I mean, this is this, one of the shocking things I think about this war, is the ratios in various battles have been reported as between one and three, uh, you know, three Russians for every Ukrainian, where the Ukrainians are starved of ammunition. Um, but where they are on the defensive and have the uh, you know, reasonably equipped, we're seeing ratios of six to one, very comparable to the Second World War ratios. Isn't it extraordinary that uh, after almost a hundred years, um, there's there's underlying mathematics of Russia's sort of inefficiency and cruelty in warfare um, that, uh, that that means they're still dying in in similar ratios. Yeah, cruelty to their own people. 
and indifference to their lives. Well, look, the uh, the Putin leadership blew up their own people in order to come to power. Uh, there was the famous incident with the Kursk submarine when they made no effort to rescue the 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 the, the sailors trapped at the bottom of the Barents Sea, and we. Putin was on vacation. He was asked about it. He said, well, he was asked later on a television show, I think with Larry King, what, you know, what, uh, you know, what was your reaction to the, you know, to the sailors uh, who were trapped in the Kursk? Uh, and his reaction was, uh, well, they drowned or they died. No, they, uh, they drowned. They drowned, I guess, was, was, it was, was the expression, Utanuli. Uh, um, but uh, it's very barbaric, very barbaric, and it's important for us to understand that about Russia. And it will be until it ceases to be a movement, starts to be a nation, and and a nation that's based on law and that's based on respect for the individual. And that's possible ultimately. And the best the best uh, hope for that is to be is defeat in the present war. Paradoxically, it would be the best thing in the world for Russia to lose this war. And this is an interesting concept, isn't it? I mean, I've been having endless arguments with people about what the influences are on the Russian state. Is it the Mongol horde? Is it the sort of uh, Byzantine hierarchy that they sort of inherited uh, with those close contacts with the, uh, you know, um, Byzantine Empire? You know, where has that political system come from? It's clear that you know, elements of culture, architecture, and so on are modeled on Europe, but actually the mechanics of the political system come from somewhere else. I think it's important to mention, as you say, the, the nation state. Russia has not gone through key processes that parts of Europe have, including Ukraine, which is, you know, Renaissance, Reformation, Enlightenment, and even that 19th century phase of nation building and nationalism. Russia, in that to that extent, has always been a multinational empire, not a nation state. So there's an awful lot of processes that consciously or unconsciously have gone into, into building the sort of the sanctity of life and rule of law that we've been talking about in the West. None of this experience, none of this history actually exists in Russia. And most of it that we that we see commonality with their culture, that's sort of copied or elements are copied, perhaps without copying the underlying sort of rules, structures, and culture. <laughs> yes, <laughs> without the without the ethics and morals that made those institutions possible. Yeah. So what Christine just said, forms. you know, uh, yeah. Marcus to Christine in the 19th century yeah. said, said that same this thing. Is a, this, Russia is a na nation of a masquerade. Uh, it's a nation of actors, and it's a charade. Uh, and... Um, but the, 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 it's the amalgamation of political and spiritual power, uh, which, uh, I mean, it was the, the, the state subordinated the, 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 the Russian Orthodox Church, which in effect became just a department of the state, ultimately. And uh, that state was... Uh, you know, based on 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 total subordination and the the concept that everything belonged, in effect, to the czar, including the people, and that kind of that kind of structure, uh, could only was stable as long as it wasn't touched. And when it was touched in the aftermath of the Crimean War and the liberation of the serfs, uh it it uh you know the evil inherent in that kind of subordination and inequality was freed to take on a life of its own and um and destroy anything that was good in the previous system and uh, that's what happened and that's what happened. We even see it. Uh, I mean, I, I had a, a friend, a dissident, Sergei Gurgaryans, who said uh, that you know the communist system was 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 evil, but it was stable. It was kind of pretty unpredictable. Said with its breakup, the evil has been released 
to spread all over the world. And that's what, and that was very prophetic. But it's a process that's repeated itself in Russian history. And the only way to, to do something about that is to be aware of the underlying evil and to address it. And this is why I would this argue. Is something, that... This is something that the West is not really very well equipped to do. And, and Russians, alas, are also not, you know, with, with, with some exceptions, are, are, are poorly equipped to do it. Right. That, that, there's an interesting point there, isn't it? Because I think many in the opposition, so-called opposition, um, do not necessarily represent the mass of, of, of Russians. And they're not necessarily in line with, uh, as you say, the motivations and even experiences of the great sort of mass of Russians. They may think they're representative of that, but, you know, someone like Karamorza, who un unfortunately seems to be... Um, uh, extremely sick and is uh, potentially not going to make it out of incarceration as admirable as those people are i don't think they have a huge amount of traction in russia and they're not necessarily seen by most russians as representative of them their mindset and their experiences no the the opposition now i mean uh you know so many people are compromised by their support for yeltsin and their support, you know, either knowingly or unknowingly of the criminalization that took place in the 1990s, or they took part in it, or they took part in it then and were part of what, you know, what has been created in Russia and which they now reject because it's turned against them. But uh, the... Uh, the role of the opposition can can be important if it if if it dedicates itself to really uh, promulgating and revealing the historical truth, the full truth about what happened and why Russia went wrong, what needs to be done. Uh, it's a big intellectual challenge. I mean, there aren't too many people in, in the opposition who are capable of that. There, there are some, though. I mean, one of the things that needs to be, and we can talk about this again at some point, that is really absolutely critical is the story of how Putin came to power by, you know, by a terrorist act against his own people. This was the greatest political provocation since the Reichstag fire. The intentional bombing of apartment buildings and the murder of hundreds of randomly chosen citizens in order to create a pretext for starting the uh, uh, second Chechen war. And that was what brought Putin into power. That's now if the if the opposition wants to be useful, the Russian opposition, that's where they should start. As I've told them many times. <laughs> ah, but of course, yeah. I mean, that's that's well. Let's let's dig into that in the next conversation because I think um, the opposition are, are mindful that if they go too far, then they will lose all touch, not only with the people, but also they will start to become a real threat to the Sylvia Key. I mean, to an extent, one can say that the opposition who are alive and practicing are almost certainly doing so because they're not a huge threat to the status quo. As soon as they would become such, then uh, I imagine it would. Well, they're be outside, they're, uh, Jonathan, they're outside the country. Mm. And uh, the, the you know, from a distance of London, uh, Paris, Berlin, uh, there isn't a great deal they can do, but they could, what, what they, you know, at least not in a practical sense, but what they could do is that they could try to influence the they could try to influence the climate of opinion in their country by by communicating to those people still in Russia the truth about this regime and its real attitude toward them toward the Russian people who are being mobilized and sent into a, a into a slaughter for no other reason than to preserve the power of a, a small group of criminals at the top 
So the last question here, I think, is really it relates back to Putin. It relates back to the sort of vertical system he's created. We know that he doesn't really understand economics and he's not really interested in it. And yet he is driving the Russian system. He is squeezing it until the pips squeak. Um, and there are indicators that the economy is overheating because of the injection of too much cash, chasing too few products. They have a shortage of workers. Infrastructure is falling apart because of lack of investment and lack of trained uh, technicians to run it. Their factories are under undermanned and under-resourced. Is Russia, is Putin rather, going to drive this Russian system um, way beyond the point that it can actually sort of sustain itself and he's going to do it because he doesn't care and doesn't realize and because everyone's too afraid to tell him the truth is there the possibility that putin will just drive this country to the point where it flies apart well uh, yeah of course it's a war economy now but the but i wouldn't be too uh, optimistic about that the uh as long as the war continues, uh, I mean, it creates enormous demand and uh, they have a lot of oil to sell. I mean, something has to change in the, in, in, in the willingness of the outside world to trade with them. And, uh, you know, it's been suggested that there be secondary sanctions against countries like India and China. But that would cause major disruptions for the world economy, which, of course, no democratic leader uh, is going to be happy to do. But, um, you know, will it fall apart as a result of the economy? Will it fall apart as a result of the, uh, the front collapsing? Uh, the, we can hope for those results. But the 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 reality is that um, uh, what's going to make the difference, I think, is you know the the Russians are very resilient. They they've got you know they see this this has been turned into a kind of crusade, uh, and you know there's a tradition in Russia of. And it, it, it's it's very very important that we win through perseverance. So what's going to really make a difference, I think, is a you know Ukrainian victory on the on the field of battle. That's a very and important that's what well, that's we shouldn't count on mana from heaven. If it ha if it happens, that would be great, and uh, and we can hope for it. And there's some signs that it might happen. But 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 we should concentrate our efforts on helping Ukraine to win. That's an incredibly important insight. I think I sincerely hope that policymakers are watching this. I know you've communicated with many over the years and uh, banged your head against a wall in that process um, to try and get people to listen Um Ukraine must win and we must give it the tools to win. I think that's, uh, if anyone takes anything away from our conversation today, I think that is the number one idea. David, it's always a huge pleasure and a privilege speaking to you. Thank you so much for dedicating this time to the channel, especially when you're on holiday. I think the audience mm -hmm. will hugely appreciate it. Thank you again. Thank you, Jonathan.